This is your government video for discrimination and civil rights. So discrimination can exist in, in many forms. It's basically when the government um, or a private individual or business classifies or treats groups differently. The question legally becomes, should the government be able to do that or not? And to what extent and when? So our government has said some discrimination is okay and other forms are not. So to give you a kind of an example, the government is legally allowed to put age restrictions on certain things. So there are age limits for driving, obtaining a license, drinking, purchasing cigarettes, lottery tickets, um, things like that. Um, other examples, pregnant women are not allowed to work in chemical factories. Um, and you know there are various forms of discrimination that have been deemed illegal by the courts and by legislative branches. Now, the 14th Amendment has an equal protection clause, which says that states have to protect all people equally. And what the Supreme Court says that means is that state governments can't be unreasonable when they're discriminating. They have to have some compelling reason in order to treat one group of people differently uh, than another or to allow some type of legal discrimination against a certain group. So it's not saying you can never discriminate for any reason. It's just saying that you can only do so if you have some serious reason, a compelling purpose that you've proved through the courts or through the legislative branch. So here are some examples. Um, affirmative action is a policy in which um, has been used legally since the civil rights movement to allow typically non-white groups, um, African-Americans, Latinos, Asians, to boost their attendance in colleges and universities. And the first major case that we had that went to the Supreme Court about affirmative action is UC Regents versus Baki. This is a case um, about um, a white man, Baki, and he was applying to the medical school at UC Davis. He applies two years in a row and he was denied two years in a row. He finds out that a black applicant with lower medical test scores uh, got into UC Davis's medical school and he did not. And he believes that his medical uh, school scores, um, his MCATs, um, should have made him a better applicant than the black applicant. Now, at the time, the UC school system used what's called a racial quota. So they looked at how many uh, spots were available at each school, and they literally said, we're going to keep this many spots open for white applicants and this percentage of spots open for Latinos and this many for Asians and this many for African Americans. So in the Baki decision, the Supreme Court said, you can use race on an application if you want, and you can use race to diversify your school, but you can't have a quota. The problem is if you, let's say, keep five spots open for white applicants and only five white applicants apply, all of them get in regardless of their other parts of their application. So you can't use racial quotas. You've got two cases that came out of the University of Michigan. In 2003, the University of Michigan used to allow bonus points on the application for race. So if one particular racial group or subgroup uh, was lacking at the University of Michigan, they could bump up the points on that group of admissions. And Supreme Court says you can't use bonus points because that could push somebody over the edge into getting um, into the school or not. But in 2003, they did, the Supreme Court did allow the University of Michigan to put race on the application and use it as a general factor along with many other things like test scores, uh, like jobs, like activities, like grades, et cetera. The latest one is 2016, and this is Fisher versus UT Austin. The UT, the UT schools, all of the UT schools, there's a state law in Texas that said, any high school student who graduates in the top 10% of their class must be admitted to UT schools. Obviously, the University of Texas at Austin is the premier UT school. It is um, very competitive and hard to get into. Well, Fisher is a um, high school woman who is looking to go into the undergraduate program. She's not in the top 10% of her class. So, so she has to apply along with everybody else um, for any of the remaining spots at UT Austin for people who did not graduate in the top 10% of their class. She is denied. And 
she says that the 10% program, because she went to a highly competitive academic school, she fell into something in the top 20 or 25%. But she said because her school was white and therefore more academic, that she was a better applicant than maybe uh, somebody in the top 10% of a different high school. And the Supreme Court turned down her argument and said that she lost this case and the UT law stands because Fisher could have chosen to go to a different school had she wanted to. So just some background on the women's rights movement. Um, the passage of the 19th Amendment allowed women to vote and that was passed in the 1920s. And between the 1920s and the 1980s, you start to see significant movements um, in allowing women more access. Um, they start to be allowed to serve on juries for the first time. Um, there were some states who didn't allow women to inherit property until the 70s. They can now get their own bank accounts and credit cards without their husband's name being on them. So the legal adoption of allowing women to vote kind of opens the doors for people to uh, trust women to make other types of decisions that legally they were not allowed to prior. So again, the civil rights movement, the Supreme Court starts to interpret the 14th Amendment, which says that states have to treat citizens equally. And it starts to interpret that 14th Amendment to allow more uh, civil and human rights, particularly for minority populations, women, uh, the disabled, racial minority groups. And we start to see increased civil liberties and civil rights for these groups. Um, there have been three waves of feminism or three women's rights movements. We're currently in the third wave. And a lot of this is started and continued by the National Organization for Women, which is one of the largest women's rights interest groups in the country. The pro-life, pro-choice movement is also seen as an extension of the women's rights movement. Um, people who are pro-life, um, sometimes, you know, people make the argument that that's restricting a woman's right to choose and that if you trust women to make good decisions about their children, then not all people who are pro-choice would choose an abortion. The current movement um, in the women's rights movement is also about equal pay. Women historically, when they go into the workplace, even if they're doing the exact same job as a man, um, are often paid less. And the Equal Pay Act, which was originally passed in 1963, um, has meant to stop that from happening, um, but it hasn't been updated in quite a while. The last group we're gonna talk about are LGBT rights, which of course, the passage and legalization of same-sex marriage was a significant proponent for that. So just to give you some background, in 1996, Bill Clinton is president. He is a Democrat, and he is very supportive of a law that uh, is he passes called the Defense of Marriage Act. And this is actually an act that defines marriage in a federal law between one man and one woman only. So a lot of people in the LGBT community really saw Bill Clinton um, as somebody who is not advocating for gay rights. And this was a significant hurdle that the LGBT community would have to overturn before they moved on to other things. This act also allowed states to not recognize same-sex marriage licenses from other states which had legalized it and for couples of um, the same sex who had got legally married in a different state. So it created a lot of issues underneath the law federally and from states. The Defense of Marriage Act would be overturned in the Windsor versus U.S. decision from 2013. This is one um, of the major cases that goes to the Supreme Court that will eventually overturn um, defining marriage as uh, one man and one woman and will eventually lead to legalizing same-sex marriage. Um, something else, Lawrence v. Texas is a Supreme Court case and Texas, along with many states at the time, but Texas was the last state in the union, had sodomy laws. And sodomy laws were passed often to put gay men in jail. Um, they were typically only applied to gay men and not heterosexual couples. And in 2003, the Supreme Court um, overturned uh, Lawrence v. Texas and banned sodomy laws. 
Later in 2013, after the Windsor decision, Hollingsworth versus Perry was passed the same summer. And the question became, does the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment stop states from defining what is a marriage compared to a different type of marriage? And the Supreme Court basically said, sort of, kind of. Um, they will go back later in 2014 and be a little bit more specific. In Obergefell versus Hodges, this is the case that ultimately uh, legalized same-sex marriage everywhere in the country. In Obergefell, the Supreme Court, which was actually a 5-4 conservative court, um, said the right to marry is a fundamental right. And the 14th Amendment's due process clause says you have to, you cannot restrict anybody's rights unless there has been a process by which they have deemed guilty. And the Equal Protection Clause says people have to be treated equally by states. And when you allow some people to marry and some people not, and some people to get uh, spousal benefits and not, and some people to get, um, let's say, health insurance from your spouse's employer or death benefits if your spouse dies or tax cuts because you're married to somebody, um, that those things have to now apply to anybody who is married, including um, people of the same sex. So that is the case that legalized it everywhere. 